Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Over the course of this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, today we are honored to welcome to the show from the town of Devon, Alberta, Councillor Mike Hanley. Mike, welcome to the show. Great to be able to speak with you today, Chris. Like I said, I don't hide the fact I'm a big fan. Uh, <laughs> as a by-election counselor, I'm drinking from the proverbial fire hose, and your show is just a fantastic resource to be able to immerse myself uh, in people who are passionate about municipal politics. Um, I can say I'm so happy I don't edit because I would not be editing that statement out of the show, even if you told me to, um, Mike, uh, so you, 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 as someone who's listened to the show, as someone who knows what the first question is going to be, let's get into the, uh, proverbial interview. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Mike? I think I've always felt that people have a responsibility to be engaged in their community. And as I followed municipal politics, I've seen things evolving. And I think it's fair to say that, you know, I think things are becoming more imminent and more uh, important for municipal politicians than ever before. I think uh, lack of funding, extreme conditions of all different descriptions uh, are making for a very volatile situation. I don't really like to use that word, but things are definitely have a lot higher stakes than they have in the past. And as I have seen these issues growing for our community, uh, even though my politicians seemed accessible, I wanted to be closer to the table. I wanted to have faster answers and, and I wanted to be part of the solutions. Was, was politics something that was always an interest of yours growing up? Was it discussed at the dinner table or did you come to it like I did and sort of just took the bull by the horns and ran with the political uh, gene in your body? <laughs> Oh, it was, uh, it, politics have definitely always been a part of my life. Uh, my dad was uh, an Indigenous labor leader in Calgary in the 1980s, um, you know, uh, helping him campaign for different candidates uh, really sort of drug me into the concept, but then also dealing with politics in his own and the union side of things just always meant there were important discussions and, and always about helping people. It was always about how to better your community and, and serve people and serve a purpose. So it made politics very exciting to talk about. So what what was the draw to municipal? Because I can imagine uh, politics of the union, politics of Indigenous relations is not traditionally in the municipal realm. So where was the, the sort of the spark that lit the municipal bug in Mike's body that said, you know what, there's a by-election in the, uh, the town of Devon, which I reside in. I'm going to throw my hat in the ring. Uh, so absolutely watching my town politics. I'm very passionate about the community I live in. Devon's a very exciting uh, and very rewarding community to live in. We have a lot to lose here. You can't just go somewhere else and find what Devon has to offer. Like that's just not an option. So, you know, being protective of what we have and uh, wanting to serve it well uh, seemed pretty natural. I did actually run in the, in the uh, election prior uh, and came very close. Uh, so when the by-election came up, it seemed like a natural opportunity to take a second swing at it. And to be honest, I think I invested a lot more effort. I really put myself out there a little more. I think I was a little too tentative, especially in a COVID election, uh, to get out there and really push my face into people and then expose myself. But it was really a rewarding experience because as much as I loved my community before, getting out there and knocking on a thousand doors or at least, you know, six or 800, as many as I got to, was very rewarding and opened my eyes to a lot. So what was happening in 2021? Because uh, if you've listened to the show, you know, I like to I, I like to know what the spark is, because you don't just wake up one day and say, I want to be closer to the action. I want to be at the council table. There must have been an issue. Or are you are you not a one issue candidate and more just want the betterment of your community? What was going on in 2021 that finally pushed you over the edge to say, OK, now is the time. Debt drew me in. <laughs> and, and I definitely I'm not going to be a, I, I refuse to be a one issue candidate because uh, that's not the way the world works. But debt really caught my attention. You know, this community really hasn't had debt before. When I say that, you know, reserves have always more than outpaced our debt. Um, and we felt a need to grow. And, and previous councils made some uh, 
some investments, um, but it changed our financial landscape and put a lot more pressure on the municipality, I think. So when I seen that debt growing, that gave me a sense of urgency. What do you mean by that? Because I, I, so for those who know, and you know as well, municipalities can't run deficit budgets, but they can borrow against uh, their operating budget to uh, build, create uh, projects and create infrastructure. So what, what are you talking about the debt that you saw in 2021? I just want to clarify for my own sake and that way people who are listening might understand a little bit better as well. Well, and that, and to be honest, that's exactly what kind of caught me off guard is I, I found out the municipal finance is a lot more complicated than I realized. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's the very simple part. And that was exactly what I seen with, with growth. So in specific, uh, we had a very huge project being a wastewater treatment plant. Everybody knows how cheap and easy those are to replace. And how much um, fun they're talk to talk about, because every, every counselor seems to want to talk about wastewater treatment facility. Exactly. That's what gets kids jumping up and down and cheering for you when you walk in the door. So, so the sexy world of municipal uh, wastewater treatment, uh, you know, here your towns, your tiny town of 6,000 people is hit with a $30 million bill. And then how do you manage that? And, you know, the province was great uh, in the sense that they stepped up and split the cost with us, but we still needed to find a big chunk of money. And um, with that being said, now that's being very slow to pay itself down. Um, it was on a scheduled payment plan as they put it out. But to be uh, fair, we're, we're using funds from our very valuable town owned utilities, um, some of those funds go to operations. So with a different mindset, we could have eliminated that debt much, much sooner. Okay, and understandable. What those, what those balances and priorities look like. Um, we've transferred out more money than we owe. To so be, to be sure about it. No, understandable. So in 2021, uh, the uh, the municipal election that happened across Alberta, not just in Devon, uh, you ran, you were close, but then a, then a vacancy comes up in the town of Devon and you decide, okay, I, I tried it once, let's try it again. Uh, were the issues that you heard at the door in 2021 the same issues that you heard at the door in the 2023 by-election? And I should say, I say 2023, we're talking like, not even five months ago, you were just elected to council. So when you talk about drinking from the proverbial fire hose, you're not drinking from it. You're basically like on the other side of the room trying to drink from it while they're trying to spray you with it. For sure. And I was following <laughs> quite closely. I tried to attend as many meetings as I could virtually, even when I when I didn't make it. Uh, my interest didn't wane and my concerns didn't go away. So I follow. I was following as closely as possible without being able to get there in the chamber. And I was following very closely. So thankfully, uh, the biggest change was COVID was a lot less talked about. Uh, I can't say how distracting that was. And then to a really frustrating extent in 2023, it really was making things more difficult. People were a lot more focused on what I would call more normal uh, municipal concerns about funding, recreation, debt, um, and affordability. Were they talking on the micro issues, like micro issue level, or are they talking more macro? Like we need better service levels at the pool, uh, the outdoor pool. We need more parks. Or were they talking, my street needs to be cleaned and it needs to be cleaned on a regular basis. Because when I sit down and talk to municipal counselors and, and you've listened to them, you, you know that residents, and I'm not trying to paint with a broad stroke here, but I'm going to have to. Sometimes they don't understand that micro issues at a provincial level aren't addressed at the municipal level. Uh, definitely that concern, but I, I got to admit, I think I had a really good mix of both. I, I We have very exceptional service delivery in Devon. Uh, we have a pretty amazing town staff. And to be fair, like the micro issues there certainly exist. And there's those conversations, but I have to just give council before me credit and administration that we enjoy a very high level of service and it makes those conversations manageable. Um, but it also, like I say, this just goes more to how much we have to lose in an amazing community like Devon when you already have these kinds of service levels. 
you you get elected in February of this year and you've had relatively a year of this current council with you excluded sort of forming that bond and you're coming in as the outsider. And I, I haven't been able to ask this question to many people who come on the show because most of the people have been elected in a general election, not in a by-election for you. How is that transition being from being the outsider to sort of being on the team and working with council and trying to catch up on the issues that they were already dealing with prior to you being elected? It's been a complete and utter paradigm shift. Just to make it even simpler, we we swapped out CAOs in in that time frame as well. So you know, being someone that was trying to follow and be updated, uh, it, it's an absolute paradigm shift to jump on the team. And all of a sudden, I'm in a position where you're not just sit here pointing a finger. You're also taking on that responsibility of marketing the wonderful town that we have, uh, and the big realization was how common our problems are to the surrounding municipalities and really across the province. And that's the paradigm shift. Now that I'm on, you know, team Devon selling us and understanding uh, instead of just trying to point out, you know, what's hiding under the carpet or anything like that. It's really, how are we being affected by these macro situations that you talk about and understanding I'm absolutely shocked by how uh, unilaterally we are, like the funding shortages across the province, the infrastructure deficit, you know, the things I've seen in my community that were concerning me, um, you know, you've got wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you're talking to people and other municipalities It's like we're looking good compared to a lot of our neighbors. And especially the tinier, you know, some of the tinier municipalities. And it's just a complete paradigm shift, you know, where, okay, this is what we're doing right. But now I realize how global these products, projects are going to be and how I'm going to have to seek collaboration. So even though I'm on team dev and I've got a fantastic council to work with, now my whole mind's trying to wrap around how do I partner with the rest of the province? I'm in a, in a province here where municipalities are facing the same sorts of huge, genuine, real concerns that we need big solutions to that are outside of our scope and control that we need to draw the attention to get big solutions to fix big problems. And that's just been a paradigm shift. Do you think the average resident knows that? Because you're right. And I'm not trying to paint you to a corner here, but I find this conversation already fascinating, Mike. Um, does, does the average resident know the paradigm shift that you, you had to go through, but also what the issues are facing the town of Devon and how they collate with other neighboring municipalities, whether it be homelessness, whether it be the infrastructure deficit that you talk about, because I, I, I think there's an apathetic nature when it comes to municipal governance that traditionally most people don't understand what the municipality's role and responsibility is. And when you're on the other side of that council table, you get firsthand knowledge and sort of understanding of what's going on in your community. Do you believe that the average resident would know what's going on and what issues are facing your community? Absolutely not. And then it's so hard to really bring that awareness home. And I, 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 I'm so happy you said that. Yeah, we not, need not to happy that you more transparent. Yeah. yeah. Continue. Sorry. No, and, and what you're saying, that's exactly what's catching me more than anything. And, and a, a really uh, respected friend, you know, I, as a firefighter here, and some of the old firefighters are, the, are my best advice I get in my life. And one of the guys said, I'm, I'm voting for you again. And he goes, but don't you disappear after you get elected like the rest of them do. And I'm not going to take that as a criticism because I don't believe there's anything deliberate with my colleagues and the people I'm working with. Nobody tries to disappear, but you have to try to manage uh, your accountability, your code of conduct. And I feel that people have a hard time really bringing this radical transparency into the public. And I think I would much rather mess this up and bring issues forward to the public than get reelected. Uh, that's where my priorities have to go. We need people to know these important issues are too important. And like when you're talking public safety, like that's just not been an issue in my life in Devon. You know, I've been here 30 years. Public safety has not been a growing issue over those 30 years until very recently. And when I see it in all the surrounding municipalities and the, even the rural area surrounding us, probably even more so, uh, things like public safety. And then you're seeing enormous causes. Like we cannot hire enough RCMP or at least get them through depot. 
you know, in time to meet the needs of communities. And it's bad enough that I'm seeing, you know, the problem actually creating itself where you're hitting more burnout, you know, exasperating itself. And, and like I say, important issues like community safety, where we may not be able to have enough officers coming on stream, the public needs to get engaged in these issues. They need to be speaking up with us to find real solutions. But you're the ones who are elected. And I think you know that and I know that. And you are the ones who sort of have to champion it. Well, residents can sit and scream on Twitter and scream on Facebook and scream on emails. You, you're you you're in the meetings. I'm not sure if you've had the chance to meet because you get elected and then a provincial election gets called. So therefore, there's a lot of changeover and the government sort of comes to a standstill for a month and a half, almost two months, depending on how you look at the last provincial election of when it actually started. Um how do you see your role in advocating for your town on all issues, even the ones that you're talking about, public safety, but also the issues that your residents are coming to you and talking to you about? Because while you have your set of agenda of what you want to believe that needs to push the town forward, you also have to remember the people who've elected you and put you in that position. So how do you balance the needs of your wants and the needs of your residents' wants, or do you find them similar? I find them very similar. And, and I think that's the thing. And I definitely, I go out of my way to find a universality there. Like we all want the same things. And that's where I find divisive politics so frustrating. <laughs> when we try to pretend that there's this red and blue world and people that want these drastically different things. And if red or blue wins, your entire paradigm and world is going to be upended and end. Like we really need to end this kind of thinking. And, and really what are the differences between people? Because like I said, you go and knock on a thousand doors and most people have the exact same answers with slight differences in where those priorities, you know, everybody prioritizes, you know, typically things like recreation, public safety, you know, the beautiful natural environment we have wrapping around us here in Devon, you know, it's pretty hard to find people that don't agree these issues are important. And, you know, our, you know, our snow removal, Devon doesn't skimp on snow removal. We have the best in the area. There's nobody who doesn't like that. Even when you get your fiscal conservatives, you know, they're, they're pretty happy to admit, you know, it's a lack of wear and tear on their vehicles. It just makes life a whole lot easier and a whole lot smoother when we spend the money to do things right. I want to ask a very weird question to you, Mike, here for a second. Because you, you seem like you're knowledgeable. You seem like you know what you're doing. But have you learned the, the word no yet in your vocabulary as counselor? Because I can imagine you're probably getting approached on a day-to-day -day basis about things that you, people want to see in their community. But you haven't gone through a budget cycle yet, but you will be going through one here in a few months or probably just starting the to operating in capital budget for next year already. Because I know as a former municipal staffer, it does happen people will come to you with their requests and you have to take those requests and try to sort through the best of the community. How do you see your role as counselor of advocating for the future of Devon, but not forgetting the individual needs because you don't have a hundred, like a hundred million dollars every year and you can't run deficits. So have you gotten used to being able to tell people no or no? Well, I almost got to run in that environment. Uh, so Devin, we've done some really great things with recreation and we're twinning an arena right now. We've done a great job securing grants. We've got an 18 and a half million dollar arena. But on the flip side of that, we have a very beautiful outdoor pool that is obviously pretty seasonal. And that leaves huge portions of our population, I would say very fairly underserviced it's fair to say that they're under service for recreation. We do a really great job in certain areas, but there's a lot of wants and needs that were going on mat and that had already been approved. And so going through, there was a pretty strong recognition that a lot of people weren't having their particular uh, wants and needs met. So I got to run in that environment um, and, and speak to it a little bit from the outside. Um, so I, I definitely got a lot of exposure to not being able to please everybody and understanding how that affects them. But I really also 
when does I does it come through... down to communication though? Does it come down to communication and just having that ability to listen to people, ask their questions, or talk about what they see as the future of Devon, even if you're not able to a hundred percent please their issues or their needs of their community? Absolutely. And I always want to try to find a way to yes, but that's exactly being able to listen to people and understand that they're always right. You know, even though their views may be different than than yours, that they are correct. And that was actually something I got through to my head really fast knocking on doors. You know, when you start putting yourself in people's face on their property, in their doorway, uh, you better be there to talk about what's important to them, not just what's important to you. And every conversation I started on the doorway was those questions. How are you feeling about things? You know, and that was my approach is understanding it's a small town, you know, 6,000 people. I work at a local retailer. I've worked there for 30 years. Uh, People know who I am and they know where to find me. So um, I don't have that option of playing games. You have to make some tough choices. When you go into that council chambers, you have to make tough choices that will impact residents the day after you make that decision uh not unlike edmonton or ottawa you can't go away and like you just said you're in your community full time you work in your community how much weight and responsibility do you put on yourself every time you walk into that council chambers to make sure you're informed on the issues but make sure that the decision you're making is going to not impact the residents of your community in a negative way. It's absolutely huge. Uh, You know, one of the first things I got to do with my particular timing was pass the tax rate, you know, the first important votes and, (laughs) and without a doubt, like I'm seeing people around me and in this particular economic situation, I see what interest rates are doing. I know what their utilities are like. I know what my bills are like. There's people that this could be the the edge. This could be what tips a few boats here. Um, and that's an absolutely, you know, that if you don't think you stay up at night when you think about that, you're going to go in there and vote for this. Um, and you just have to really commit yourself to that overall good. So it really gets your nose into the agendas. It makes you really want to drill through, make sure that you try to find the extra questions to ask. And that if I can think of a residence or or a a point of view that hasn't been gone at, uh, that is what I try, I really try to find find and focus. I try to, you know, a little bit about your fellow counselors and especially in a smaller community, that's a huge blessing that you can sort of guess where certain people are going to go with their questions and concerns. And I'll be honest, uh, I've always sort of been that person. Okay, if you're going to cover this and you're going to cover that, what am I going to bring up then? And I try to be that person that digs out that other issue then if everybody's going to do it, because I really do believe that when we use words like inclusion, inclusion is not this group of people. Inclusion always has to be expansive. And that, like that just goes with us, what we're you know talking about just briefly here, you know, with the red and the blue and these sorts of things that we see in our society. Like, can you tell me a person that you've honestly ever met in your life that really wants to argue that inclusion is a bad thing? Like if you use the word properly, but you have people now that inclusion could be a divisive political word. Anything can be divisive in 2023, Mike. Come on, you and I both know that. And that's coming from me, who's been on the front lines of include it. Anyway, I yeah, no. I, I, for those who are about to send the net negative emails to me, it's crossborderphotography at gmail.com. Send them to me. They'll be filed in the appropriate location. <laughs> Anyway, um, you, you talk <laughs> sorry to me. if I flustered you there. No, no, I, I, it's just yeah. You talk about the echo chambers that we have, right? Because we want to go listen to the people that agree with us. We want to go talk to the people that are on our social media feeds, our uh, our Facebook. How do you switch the script and talk to everyone, not just the reds, not just the blues, but the greens, the oranges, the purples, the burgundies, the blacks, the whites, the grays? How do you talk to everyone and make sure that the informed decision that you're voting on, the decision you're voting on is the best that will make sure that everyone feels like they've been heard by you, but also make sure that they are feeling like you're not just another politician who will get elected and not come see them for four years until the next election. 
Well, sincerity and hard work and, and just <laughs> honesty and accountability. Like those are like, they're very simple concepts, but you can't really deviate from them. So uh, without actually interviewing everyone in the room, I do believe I'm the only Indigenous member on council. I'm a Métis person. I'm very happy to be able to, uh, to trace my ancestry through long before Alberta's history. And we were a leader in Indigenous engagement in our region, uh, you know, prior to this council. And we had the very unfortunate uh, experience of losing our, our coordinator for that position. And when it came to this issue, this is where I really, if there was ever an issue that was possibly going to have me on a different side than all my residents, I feel like this was probably that issue where, you know, perhaps I had a lot bigger stake in this than a lot of other people or at least I could definitely respect that possibility. So I was as responsible as I could about it. I, this is an important thing where I honestly, genuinely see enormous benefits that I don't think a lot of people understand. I don't think a lot of people understand what the huge strides we're making in Indigenous engagement when we've actually decided to invite a huge portion of the population into the economy to productively succeed and be a real meaningful part of the Canadian and participate meaningfully in the Canadian economy for the first time in hundreds of years. Um, this is a powerful growth opportunity for everybody. So the first thing I try to do is explain, you know, this is a situation from my perspective, you know, you think the government spending money or you think somebody's putting money towards these programs you don't typically hear just that kind of when we see infrastructure spending or that type of spending in other communities or in other groups of people you don't typically hear those concerns people can usually respect the investment and see the other side and then the other side of that was i also wanted to manage the affordability of these programs within my community and I believe if I want to deliver the maximum value, there's no question a tiny community like Devon has to be willing to collaborate. So even though this program had tons of supporters that would absolutely uh, support the status quo, I really want more. I want a program that can grow and be more. And because of that, um, I supported the opportunity uh, that some seen as a cost cutting measure but I see as the opportunity growth of a collaborative approach. We're trying to reach out to the surrounding municipalities because an indigenous engagement coordinator does not work just within the community of Devon. That position just cannot be what it needs to be if this person never leaves our borders. So it seems like such a natural thing where we need to be reaching out. So that's where I would say like, even though I see my own interests and I'd rather I could be just in Devon and let Devon be this island of things that I'm so proud of to share with my kids and my wife and my family, you know, that we're so proud of what we've seen going on in Devon. I know it has to grow bigger and I know I have to be financially accountable for whatever investments we make to the residents. So I don't know if that's a, you know, a widely, I hope people will share that, that view that I'm, even if I see my own interest, my own personal interest, I'm always going to try to put the other person at an equal level. That person who may see the opposite side of the coin, I do really try as hard as I can to balance their perspective and, and give it as much weight as my own. But you're willing to chat with them, I'm assuming, right? Like you're not just going to blow yeah, them up, even if the, you don't agree with them or if they don't agree with you. It's about the respect. And that, like you said, the key word that you said there is collaboration. Even if you collaborate them with them, have that conversation, respect them enough to have that conversation. You, at the end of the day, still have to make the tough decision on how you're going to vote on certain issues or if what service levels are going to be cut. Absolutely. And that, and that's exactly what I mean here. So we're, we've already have grant applications and other things that are contingent in, in the fact that we are supporting this type of program. You know, Devin, uh, we put ourselves forward and, and we do these things, but you do talk to residents that don't want to see any funding for something like this because they don't see the, any direct benefit. So to those residents, you know, you try to point out some of the successful grant applications and the things this has helped with, but we don't really have that option of backing right away, but giving them that information so they at least understand the whole picture uh, and being fair and realistic about it, that if I wanted to try to do what you're asking, you know, for people that would say, like, we need to get rid of this funding, this is money we can't afford, get rid of it all together and try to show them what that world looks like. You know, this is what you you would really be asking for us, you know, to possibly uh, risk uh, grant funding applications, important programs that are under already underway and things that we've already committed to. 
I want to turn to the town of Devon as a whole now. And before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is his opinion, not his, not a direction of councillor or policy of councillor or a motion of council. Uh, Mike, in your opinion, as of recording this interview, what do you see is the biggest issue or issues facing the town of Devon? Uh, growth and affordability. And just that those two things are so closely tied, the only way to manage our tax rate is going to be to add some assessments. The only way we're going to be able to continue to deliver similar service levels uh, without just drastically increasing taxes on a regular basis is to increase some assessment. So manage growth and affordability. Um, and, and I can't stress affordability enough. Getting that right kind of growth uh, trying to find ways to make life more affordable for people and also trying to bring some equity. Where How do you can. see yourself playing a role in addressing the growth issue? Uh, I know you work as a council, as an entire entity, but you are there elected by the people uh, of Devon to advocate for them as well. So wh what role do you see in yourself in playing in addressing the growth and uh, sort of the, the management of the growth that your community needs so that way it's not being the service levels aren't being impacted. For sure. And, and I'm somebody that probably has, uh, as far as private sector goes, at least a little more financial management experience. You know, at least I've had to deal with budgets of similar sizes in, in my professional life. And you've seen when you get to move big numbers around and you have to deal with different types of revenue. Um, and with that being said, I, I really differentiate different types of revenue within our budgets. And I, I think there's a time and a place. And I think certain monies can be used for certain things. And other monies really have to be treated differently. The best example for Devon would be photo radar. And I seen just absolutely fantastic um, management. I didn't like the whole photo radar thing much when it came out, being a member of the business community. And I had a lot of family members tell me they'd steer right around Devon when we hit national headlines for some, some huge, huge photo radar revenues when we, were, we pioneered that. Uh, but on the flip side, when council had these revenues come in, they were always very responsible. Like none of these things were showing up in next year's budget. Everything was automatically set aside for reserves. It's like, we are not going to budget on, you know, paying for policing, on bringing policing revenues into operational budget. This isn't the way we're going to fund our community. This money has to go there uh, into reserves and be set aside for other things. So it's not driving decisions. And that was where living in Devon and watching good government, you know, gave me really strong ideas about this. There's certain types of revenues that need to be cert treated in certain ways to respect, you know, A, where they're coming from and, and B, the damage that it could do. And, you know, for a, a community like Devon that's lucky and, and wise enough due to, you know, a lot of good people working hard for this town, we still have uh, most of our own utilities. We have a gas utility, water. Um, we're, we're doing a pretty good job on that front and that gives us a much more diverse uh, revenue stream. But again, this is where I start saying, you know, I wanna be really careful because things like utilities, uh, by their nature, they're very infrastructure intensive, as we've discussed. <laughs> uh, and infrastructure is something nobody ever wants to talk about because infrastructure is the value you don't see. When you walk on top of it, it's underneath the ground. You never see all this infrastructure that's involved. So it's really hard to place that value on it. So uh, as, a, as a result, it's really difficult to fund, you know, things like infrastructure, whereas when you get something like a recreation complex, a swimming pool, like covering a swimming pool or improving those sorts of things, there's all these really big, even snow removal, you know, there's these big visible everyday things that people realize every day. But if we take money that to me, and I would say any user fee and any flat rate that's attached to a utility rate, um, by its nature to me, that funding is earmarked for uh, infrastructure. If you're taking a flat user fee, because otherwise we would be supporting fee models that aren't respectful of economic 
conditions. You can't be having your poorest people in the community paying the same as the richest people. You know, I talked to very few people that would ever, ever support that type of a taxation regime where everybody should pay equally, especially when you're talking about an absolute fat fee, like everybody pays that same 30 and $60, you know, whether you're talking about waste or your utility surcharges, so if you're going to have all these flat fees, those types of things are justified by the need for infrastructure, I believe. And then when I've looked at different funding models and what I can find out about infrastructure funding, it's, it's required because you need that stability. But if we're going to trade off income inequality and use things like this to offset taxation, you know, so maybe people don't see spending increases in the same light. These are things I'm going to have a much harder time supporting. And, and I do feel that that's a place where I have a different view than definitely some people on council. I hope to get everybody on council, uh, you know, to acknowledge some of these things because I don't, I don't feel that they're really that controversial of ideas. You know, I think if we all want to sit down and, and discuss what's right and what's wrong, and I do believe that a lot of issues do have right and wrong, especially when you talk about things like income equality, you know, people have where they want their moral standards, they have decisions they can be proud of. And I would say income equality for most people is, is something that's pretty agreeable. You mentioned two words in that statement that you just gave, and I want to ask the follow-up to that. You said the words good governance, good government. What does that mean to you? What does good government mean to Councillor Mike Hanley? Good government is transparent. It's responsive. And, you know, those things are two very closely relied, uh, very closely related. Um, you know, you want to be forthright. Like anytime uh, there was a really common line in a lot of our budgets that said reduce the impact to taxpayers. And I would have to struggle once where I found that statement was used accurately. Really? Uh, <laughs> Uh, whenever the words reduce the impact to taxpayers were used, it was generally meant that the money was coming from somewhere else. And, and very rarely was it just, you know, something like a grant. That, that, that wasn't where this, this, this phrase was being used very, and it started to seem to show a pattern to me that, it, and, and I would say it was carving out an infrastructure deficit, if I'm going to be like just straight up about it. We're going to do this to, to reduce and you need really forthright decisions that aren't making decisions like that. You want your words to mean what you say. You're not going to, to use words in a way that you could maybe say aren't lying or anything like that. You need the absolute truth in the words that you bring. And that's what good government should look like. You shouldn't have to try to decode what somebody's saying. It should be what it sounds like. Because why else are you going to waste the time to actually say it if you don't mean it? Um, this is for my own, my own sanity here. We, we, we understand that even those grants are coming from the taxpayers, right? Like the taxes pay and then the government gives their grants, which come from the taxpayers. Anyway, there's, there's Absolutely. my, ran, there's my random thought for the day. <laughs> well, thanks for coming to Chris Brown's Ted talk. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I never want to diminish that, but obviously we have to be, uh, I think more accountable. Like when you're the yeah. one, you know, passing that tax levy, there's a different feeling of responsibility for the burdens I place on the community. You know, with my decisions, I, f I just feel a different level of responsibility for the burden I put directly with my decisions. So by the time this airs, you will have been in office for about five months now. You talk about absolute truth. You talk about forthright you talk about transparency have you worked on that since you've been elected to be transparent with the people to give them the absolute truth of what's going on in uh devon do you believe that you're forthright with the people who ask you the questions that are uh, what's going on in the community in a face-to-face -face version yes but i think i really uh, just this week, I've finally been getting to the point where I'm a lot more comfortable and really wanting to reach out a lot more with that. Uh, I'm lucky enough to live uh, close to Stony Plain and, and they've got a mayor that I just love how he goes out. When I talk about transparency, William Choi. Uh, William, so okay. William, and he's the first guy, uh, happened to go to high school with my wife. 
and following his Facebook feed right away. Like here's uh, when he's uh, putting in his first expense for claims and reports, you know, right out on his Facebook page and things like this. And those were things that got me excited. It's like, if I'm going to put something in and remit them, and I think that that there's a, I know there's a lot more I can do to be even more transparent. I want to start sharing these things with people so they understand better. You know, what am I billing for? And when you see counselors out there and they see the the changes in council pay or the difference between how different counselors and, and mayors are paid, I don't think a lot of people respect how much volunteer time goes in for one thing to be fair to people. Uh, and to see those differences of how many things most of my colleagues, there's not one colleague on around that table that bills for everything they could bill for. You know, and I've never seen, you know, talking and there's some people that bill for nothing, you know, other than the, the, their base. And to have some understanding that these people aren't out there trying to gouge you. Um, I'm seeing people doing great things, but they're not necessarily sharing in a way that lets the public see that. And I feel simple things like sharing your own direct ones. And then I want to share the motions. Like I want to do a better job. You know, we've created processes in our, in our bylaws that we need to give notice of motion and things like this. So, you know, our other counselors can be prepared, but I feel like we're going to need to try harder and harder to make sure that we're reaching out to the public so they know when these motions are coming up for first reading, you know, as soon as council does, so people have more opportunity to be engaged. So these are things I'm really trying to get control of and plan better communication because people need more. They, they need that opportunity if they want it. And, and we have social media tools that should make this stuff easy. They can, you don't get home, you can read it on Facebook at midnight. If you don't get home till midnight, you don't have to be at that council meeting, you know, at that specific date and time. I, I give you credit where credit's due. I say, great, do that. Uh, I, I, I am cautiously optimistic that this can happen. But in my past experience as a communications for a municipality, uh, unless you go door to door every single time that you want to talk about something, you're not going to please everyone. <laughs> About yeah, that hundred Facebook followers only goes so far, <laughs> and it's very uh, slow to grow outside the election cycle. We will add that to the show notes as well to uh, Mike's uh, Facebook page, and I believe you have Twitter, if I'm not mistaken. Correct? Or I no? do. I am very fortunate to have a 15 year old son that uh, brings me into the Instagram and Twitter world. <laughs> so uh, I have much less uh, direct influence on my Twitter and Instagram. I do struggle with some of this stuff and I'm, I'm definitely still learning, but I am, I'm trying to grow that profile and trying to make sure I'm not missing. So thank you. We'll throw it up there on the show notes. Uh, I want to turn to my last kind of conversation here and it's my favorite. It's tourism. I love tourism. I love marketing and I love coming to communities and spending my economic dollars in the community. I told your fellow councillor Ben Gronberg that I will be in the community. Uh, I'm actually looking at probably in the next few weeks, but I think the Friday this airs, I will be up in Devon. So that just tells you in July, I'll be up there. Um, but in your opinion, because I got that, uh, Councillor Gronberg's uh, opinion on what he believes uh, are some of the tourist destinations in Devon. What do you see as the hidden gems of your community, Mike? Oh, Devon's absolutely a fantastic place. And, and we've got a good week for you if you have it, uh, for sure. But we have some amazing amenities. It's still, in my mind, the Devonian Botanic Gardens, because the first 30 years I lived there, but the University of Alberta Botanic Gardens are absolutely an incredible walk. It's a really cool place to be on a hot day. Uh, fantastic sights to see out there. And then right across the highway, if you just shoot over like literally a mile or two, you're at the Clifford E. Lee Nature Sanctuary. And this is a fantastic boardwalk that lets you walk out immersive with wildlife, depending how much water, hopefully the water levels are high, but you get right in there. The birds, uh, all the, the babies should be out there. Uh, and it'll be a fantastic, you walk through the woods, you've got squirrels. If you bring some, uh, some bird food and stuff, it's not uncommon to have little birds feeding out of your hand, uh, but definitely gets to see squirrels, rabbits, possibly porcupines. Uh, out there are pretty common sites, maybe even a coyote. Um, that's amazing at the Clifford E. Lee Sanctuary. I don't know if you fish, but we have the wonderful river that goes right through town and right down by the bridge. One of my coworkers seen a 30 pound sturgeon caught on his lunch hour when he just went down there, right under the bridge in Devon. 
So fishing is amazing, just right at our very footstep. But also, uh, we have an amazing group called the Devon Fishing Game, and they sponsor something called the Jim Nelson Memorial Trout Pond. And this is for people who want to fish, but maybe haven't is the way I would describe trout ponds are one of the most amazing things. So if you, if you want to fish, but you don't have a ton of experience or equipment, these trout ponds are amazing ways to just dip, you know, dip a hook, have some fun, just give it a little try. Uh, it should be freshly stocked, you know, early in the year, if you're out here in July, these are definitely some of my favorites. On your way back from the trout pond, on your way back into town, you'll find the Canadian Energy Museum. It will be on your right hand side. It'll be a much safer turn if you do it on your way back from the trout pond. <laughs> uh, and to me, the Canadian Energy Museum, like anybody who knows the history of this province, this is Le Duke number one. This is what changed the economy. This is, you know, Turner Valley part two. Uh, when it really flipped the switch for the Alberta economy and to be able to go out there, see some of the initial hardware, have some great displays and equipment. If you have any interest in that, the Canadian Energy Museum is a great stop for anybody. And to me, I hope there's some diversity there, you know, other than our great walking and biking trails that are all around Devon, you don't have to leave for. And the biggest thing I really don't want to miss out on, you need to plan time in your day Devon has some of the best ice cream values in the area. And if we're going to talk about importance, you know, in July, when our ice cream cones, you know, might be half of what you're going to pay in Edmonton, uh, you got to enjoy some fantastic ice cream when you're walking around and enjoying what Devon has to offer. Well, I, I, I'm bringing someone from Nova Scotia who likes ice cream, who likes birds. I do not. I'm definitely afraid of them. So that should be a fun walk. Who likes museums. So I'm looking forward to coming up to Devon now and actually visiting some of these locations and, of course, getting some ice cream. But for you, after a long day, after a stressful day at council where you just need to decompress, where do you go in the town to just get away from it all is it your house is there a park is there a wa local watering hole that you can just go away and just let your worries wash away we have uh again in these walking trails uh, i have 200 pound dogs like my little dog's 100 pounds um and uh little we have dog. Like, the fire <laughs> stairs <laughs> so uh we have the legs of fire stairs and it's a, just an absolute great way, you know, where if I only have, especially cause I don't have a lot of time when I can have a half hour, an hour to myself, it just gives me that a great rush. It's definitely not for everyone. Uh, it's a nice steep hike up, but the legs of fire stairs for me are a really special place because they, they give me that emotional sanity when I need to blow off steam in a nice natural, fairly natural environment allowing me have that fresh air, and uh, a good time with my dogs, uh, making my my younger dog uh, a little bit tired, so she's a little more manageable. <laughs> the million dollar question I want to end the conversation, the interview with Mike, is this: In your opinion, what makes the town of Devon such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Devon was built by the most incredible people. I am always so proud to be from Devon and what Devon's always meant and stood for. Uh, and I don't mean this to slight any of the communities around us, but when Devon was founded, uh, it was when, you know, farming and established communities around us didn't want these, you know, dirty oil field workers cluttering up their town. And I just got to tell you that Devon was founded by some of the most hardworking, genuine and industrious people. And that has never left us. Devon is the type of town where people get things done. We have the recreation and the amenities and the utilities and things like for such a small town because we had people that were willing to work and do things and work together. Uh, and that's something we, we struggle with now because there is, there's a lot of expectation for things to be given to you, right? Like whether you're looking for grant funding or these different things, you know, uh, there's a lot of people, anybody who's been around Devon long enough knows that the community pool, uh, a lot of bags of cement fell off SO's trucks. Uh, and people's volunteer hours in their spare time. And these things just got done to make Devon the community it needed to be. But that industriousness, the fundraising, communities coming together, you know, the community center right across the street from my house was, was almost completely paid for before they opened the doors. People just seen this need, started the fundraising committees on their own, and then went to council when they were ready for support. 
you know, Devon's a pretty dreamy community to live in when you see the fantastic people that make Devon happen. Um, and, and I just wouldn't trade that. Like I say, I can't imagine living somewhere else. It would be a really hard thing for me because we have amazing people in Devon. Mike, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking, I said 45 minutes, we're almost close to an hour now, but that's the great thing about these conversations. They fly by, but it's it's great to talk to someone who has so much passion for their community and is wanting the best for their community. We need more people like you to step up and want the betterment of their community. So thank you so much for sitting down and having this conversation with me today. Thank you for trying to give municipal politicians a voice because I do think there's a lot of us that are exactly like me. I think that's what draws people into municipal politics. It's that passion for your community. So thank you for giving us a voice. No, no worries. So with that, I want to remind everyone, if you want to follow Mike's social media, the links are in the show notes. But until next time on the Cross Border Interviews, remember, just keep talking.